Welcome to our very first episode and season of Routine Rundown, the show where we discuss the beauty industry and our routines beyond what beats the eye. I'm your host, Zoe Weiner, a senior beauty editor at Well & Good. Today, we're speaking with Renee Rouleau, a celebrity esthetician and skincare expert who's basically beauty royalty. She's been in the industry for more than 30 years and has focused her work and her namesake skincare line on helping people understand their skin instead of piling on whatever products social media tells them to. Our conversation covered everything from the nine, yes, you heard that right, nine different skin types, to how far the beauty industry has come since Renee started her career three decades ago. It was such a treat to speak to her, and I hope you enjoy our conversation and even share the episode with a friend, leave us a review, and email your takeaways to us at podcast at wellandgood.com. Then go ahead and subscribe to our newsletter, which is linked in the show notes to keep the conversation going. Let's get into it. My name is Renee Rouleau. I'm a celebrity esthetician and founder of Renee Rouleau Skincare. My philosophy about skin started when I first became an esthetician. When I went to school for training, they taught you about three different skin types, dry, normal, and oily. I went out into the real world and I quickly realized the skin was more complicated. So I've created a concept where I believe there are nine types of skin and I built a skincare line based on the nine skin types because your skin is unique and so should your skincare routine be. I love that. And would you mind walking me through what those nine skin types are? Because I think we still talk about dry, oily, sensitive, and that's it really. Yeah. The names are a little bit long for each, so I won't go into the very specifics of those. But in general, one is going to be like your most acneic. Because a big thing with breakouts is frequency. Somebody who just breaks out once a month during their menstrual cycle and only gets a cyst on their chin is very, very different from somebody who's getting two new breakouts a day, right? So you can't treat breakouts all the same. And that's the problem with most skincare lines. They're like, oh, this is a line for acne. Well, what type of acne? What type of breakouts? What's the frequency? I mean, there's a lot of factors at play and everybody just kind of lumps you into one. Skin type two is more occasional breakouts, but concerned about anti-aging. So kind of that balance, right? That's somebody like who's maybe 30 years old and or 35 and they're like still get breakouts, but guess what? Lines and wrinkles are coming in. So how do you manage both of those? Three and four are more acne prone. One is more for sensitive red, more delicate skin. One is less so that way. Skin type five is more for like rosacea sensitivity. Breakouts aren't really an issue, but they can maybe be a little combination in the summer, but get a little dry in the winter. Six is that same dry in the winter combination in the summer but no sensitivity, but just wants to keep the skin glowing. Also, certain nuances of all of these are if people have discoloration, hyperpigmentation, that sort of thing. Skin types seven, eight, and nine are more of our dry skin categories, but they're broken down into skin sensitivity, amount of sun damage, if you've had a lot of sun damage, loss of tone. Skin type seven is more kind of dull, tired. You want to really bring that brightness to the skin, more of a glow. So those are some of the nuances between the different skin types. And how does that translate into looking for products? Because I feel like I am a dry skin person. So I need moisture. I need ceramides. I need hyaluronic acid. But then I break out around my period. I sometimes get an oily T-zone in the summer. These skin types, it makes it sound like you're looking at things more holistically almost, like really the bigger picture. Correct. I solve that problem. <laughs> so the challenge is, is for the consumers, yeah, exactly what you described, like, hey, my skin's dry, but I still get breakouts. What am I supposed to do here? Because, you know, historically, if we're focused on dry skin, well, what does that mean? Heavy, greasy, really emollient, rich, but that's not probably helping your breakouts, right? But then if you go to a breakout routine, now you're talking drying, harsh, strong, and anything but giving your skin moisture. So I solve for that with the nine skin types. But yeah, I would say just in general, that's a huge problem that consumers have is, hey, I have all these things going on with my skin. How do I give my skin all of those needs? And of course, each nine skin type, you get a very curated routine. 
But my suggestion for you as a consumer is sometimes if you know that your breakouts are in a certain area of the face, then maybe you use a little bit of an acne focused routine just for that area. Like if you're like, it's always my chin, then maybe you can plug it in that way. Or maybe in the summer, make sure you're lightening things up if you find that you get more breakouts then. A lot of times when people look at their skin, if their skin is dry, everybody's really into having this shiny glass skin, radiant glow. If somebody wants that, you know, a lot of times people are using facial oils and really heavy things to get that. But again, if you're breakout prone, that's not going to agree with your skin. Your skin really doesn't like that. So I tell some people to get a glow, don't rely on heavy things, but instead maybe get a shimmery powder, right? Like a light reflective powder that gives you that shine and that glow, but it's only doing it from a powder. So it won't interfere with clogging your pores. So That's a suggestion that I give sometimes. I love that. And I know that your whole ideology is like, there's no such thing as one size fits all, which I feel like there are so many different sizes, I guess, that we would call so many different types. Yeah. This to me feels really interesting right now when it seems like we're at this time where social media is dominating skincare, TikTok, Instagram, new products all the time. Have you seen people more now than let's say 10 years ago falling into the trap of like, okay, I saw this influencer with dry skin who loves this moisturizer. So it must be perfect for me and kind of diluting it almost in that way. Yeah. It's a, it's a wild, wild world out there now. And I think consumers are super hungry for information, but I think it's this information overload. And that's why they come to see us or they consult with an esthetician because they have to block out that noise. And then people are making up things just for clickbait, right? Like these crazy at home, who knows what things. And to me, it's the definition of insanity. Like it's just wild. And then things go viral and everybody's trying something and it's not healthy for the skin. But hey, you get likes and you get comments and you get engagement and At the end of the day, that's all that matters. And I feel sorry for consumers because it's a lot to try to sort through. It's hard. We just had to do a story that was, please, please don't make your own sunscreen at home because people were seeing it on TikTok and we're like, we're going to put, I don't even it was like orange oil or something. And that's not the same as buying Mm. SPF. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, an SPF is an FDA approved drug. Like you are not going to be able to make that at home and have it work. Yeah. And I imagine, I mean, you've been in the industry for 30 years, right? 30 plus. So pre-Instagram, I imagine there's a big kind of <laughs> divide of the pre- pre-Instagram skincare and post-Instagram. And I'm curious how that's changed and the questions you're getting, what you're seeing people shopping for on both the esthetician and the product development side. Yeah, it's interesting because it's changed a lot. I think the nice thing is, even though it's so much more confusing now because there's so many brands popping up and different philosophies, I think ultimately people are looking for solutions to problems and that has never changed. But I think the nice thing is, is that there have been more advancements in skincare. And back when I started, I mean, it was just a cleanser and a moisturizer. The word serum wasn't even in existence back then. So there's a lot more sophistication with our products, a lot more sophistication with our home routine. We have a lot more control over things, if you will. We were kind of always at the mercy of an esthetician or a dermatologist and a prescription or something. So there's a lot more control we have with our skin now. But then that creates a whole new set of challenges, which is if you do too much and you don't know where that balance is, then you're creating a whole new set of problems. So it's like at the end of the day, we need to listen to Mother Nature. And some people try to control things too much and they create problems for their skin. Yeah, we saw so much just on our editorial side and what people were buzzing about during the most serious lockdown phase of the pandemic. Everyone was home. They were trying a zillion different things. They were learning about skincare for the first time. And now I feel like everyone is talking about sensitive skin and sensitized skin. So it's just an interesting like roller coaster, I feel like, in this industry that I imagine you've seen a lot of in your career. (laughs) Yeah. Well, let me touch on that real quick. When you say sensitive skin, Zoe, I'm sure you're referring to like the concept of barrier repair. But I would argue that our barrier is probably way healthier than it used to be. Case in point, back when I started, one of the most popular skincare lines for consumers in the late 80s and well into the 90s was Clinique. Well, fun fact that you probably don't know about this, Zoe, but Clinique had their clarifying lotions, which they still do. But one of them had an ingredient in it called acetone. 
that you literally could remove your nail polish with it. So me as an esthetician, when I would have clients come in and talk about their skin, they're like, oh, I'm using Clinique. And I'd say, which clarifying lotion are you using? They would tell me I had a sample of it and I pulled it out and I would show them how it actually would remove nail polish. We know like alcohol-based toners were a big thing for a long time, but there was actually acetone and alcohol in it. And then also like bar soaps, no matter all the moisturizing ingredients you could put in it, the reality of bar soaps is the binders that hold a bar of soap together naturally have a high pH. So now you're like soaps are drying. I mean, yes, there are things you can put into it to make them less drying, but the pH of a bar soap is usually much higher than the skin's natural pH. So now we know to use like a sulfate-free cleanser, low foaming cleansers, so we actually have gotten a lot gentler with our skin. Now, the argument could also be made, oh, but Renee, we're using prescription retinoids and we're using acids. So we're using things that do break down the skin's barrier more. But the reality is prescription retinoids, I think it was 1994, and they became FDA approved for the treatment of photo aging and sun damage and wrinkles. My clients all went on it back then, but there was no education on how to use it how much to use, how often. And I had a client that called me. She's like, Renee, I'm starting to use this prescription and it's drying out my skin. And I thought it was supposed to help my wrinkles, but now it's making me all dry. And she came in and she literally smiled and her nasal labial fold literally cracked and bled in front of my very own eyes. And that was from a prescription retinoids. Everyone went off of it because it was too drying. Nobody knew how to use it, right? The fact is, it's never changed. It's always going to be drying. Now, granted, they've made less drying formulas, but retinoids will damage the skin barrier and they do make the skin more sensitive. But now there's been this resurgence and there's a lot more education now about how to use it. Point being is, yes, the concept of your skin's barrier and damaging your skin barrier and barrier repair, that's very buzzy right now. But we are far less sensitive than we used to be. <laughs> That's interesting. Also, I wish that our listeners could have seen my face as you were talking about acetone. <laughs> and so I like my full skin is crawling. It was real. And then eventually Clinique took out the acetone. But they, for years, the alcohol was still in there. And like, we know you would not put SD alcohol or denatured alcohol on your face as a toner. A toner with alcohol, like you would never use that anymore. So yeah, I think our skin is way more hydrated than it used to be. I would say I really not even started getting into skincare, just purchased my first skincare product probably like 18, 19 years ago. And it was those really alcoholic Stridex pads. Yes, Stridex pads. And also like Seabreeze, uh, you know, like that toner Seabreeze that had alcohol in it. Yeah. There was a lot we did to our skin. Yeah. I'm like, Y2K fashion, totally fine to come back. <laughs> Y2K skincare, let's please leave it back where it belongs. How have we kind of gotten to this point where Number one, people care about restoring your skin barrier. And number two, that there are products that are meeting them where they're at. Yeah, well, I think it's really consumers desired for information. So back certainly when I started, I was writing skincare articles for my website when I launched in 1996. So I've been pushing out content for a long time and our customers love it. Back in the day, you were either selling skincare products or you were a content site and no one was merging the two. And I've been merging the two for a million years, but I've always known that consumers are super curious because it all goes back to a, a sense of control. People want to be able to problem solve and control. And so, yeah, people are hungry for knowledge. But as I said, in this day and age, there's too much knowledge out there and there's too many opinions. And, you know, it's no different than when you go to the doctor and they tell you something and you go see a second doctor for a second opinion. Well, if one doctor says take a left and one says take a right, who are you supposed to believe? But what's happening in skincare is there's just so much information and we all have to dissect that. And when it comes to products, there's so many lines out there and different philosophies. But that's where I think Renee Rillo Skincare does well is because people trust me. I have a track record of 30 plus years and the nine skin types speak to people. People are like, this makes sense. And people want a curated routine. So it's like, People need that individual attention for their skin in order to drive results. I love that. And I even thought about that concept of all skin types because your skin's needs change, obviously, as you age. Correct. Uh, correct. So we're just a D2C company. I've been exclusively online since we launched in 1999, other than my 
two skincare spas that I had in Dallas for many years, but now we're 100% online, but I'm not in retailers. And why? I could be if I wanted to, but I have 50 products in my line and retailers, when they want me in their store, they only want the hero products, right? They're not going to have all 50, right? And so they're like, Renee, we would love to have you in our store. What are your 10 best sellers? We'll take those. Well, then like that totally goes against my philosophy of nine different skin types. So it's really like against my brand ethos. If I'm not, you know, giving a curated routine for people, your skin is unique and you can't just use one product for every type of skin. I think that makes so much sense because, I mean, it's my full-time job to learn about and know about skincare, and it's so confusing. There's so much out there. There There's so many different opinions, and I think especially at large retailers or when you're shopping on social media, like all of these things, you're just, it's kind of like, this looks good, this looks good, this looks good, instead of really looking at the whole concept. I've heard so many stories of people showing up to estheticians and dermatologists, the big bag of products in their hands, having no idea what any of them do, and like, ruining their skin, basically. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I've also heard you talk a little bit about being a detective for your own skincare, which definitely sounds in opposition to this, like, put everything on all at once, which I love. Can you tell me a little bit about that and why it's important to do that kind of investigation work on your own skin? And if you have any tips for how people can do that at home? So part of playing detective is when I have a client, he or she is with me for an hour or hour and a half. And we are literally talking for the full time. I am here to talk to you about your skin, psychoanalyze your pores, figure out your routine and giving an output of a game plan for your skin to drive results. So for consumers at home, I would say the big thing is to listen to your skin. I mentioned earlier, mother nature. I always go back to mother nature. If it's telling you something you have to listen. And people don't do that. They just think they know it all. I read something, I saw something online that says to do this, but they're not really paying attention to their skin. So like really pause, listen to your skin. What has changed? What am I doing differently? And the hard part, again, is it's hard to always know the answers. Sometimes we just have to surrender that we may not know the answers. You know, some some things in life are a mystery. Sometimes we've exhausted every option and we just don't know. And then you just kind of say, well, this is what's in the cards for me and have a little bit of self-acceptance there. Your, your skin is sending you signals and just try to pay attention to that. I feel like there's this ideology floating around out there that I personally don't subscribe to, but that's like, just do nothing and your skin will do its own thing. But there is a place for products, obviously, right? There's no like, just stop it all and let your skin do its thing. Of course, of course, without a doubt, products could absolutely do correction. I use the word correction. So a ship is turning a different way. We can turn the ship around, right? And drive better results. So yeah, products absolutely make a difference. I think, as I mentioned earlier, there have been a lot of advancements. So now more than ever, our skin is better than it's ever been. So if we look historically, there's less breakouts. We can't cure acne, but we sure can control it way better than we ever did based on the advancements. When it comes to a lot of advancements in sunscreen, there's higher SPF numbers. They wear better on the skin. They're more matte. So your skin's natural oil doesn't dissolve them as much and break them down as quickly. Yeah, we can absolutely create very serious positive change on the skin with skincare products, no doubt. Now for the crux of our show, the routine rundown. I would love to hear what's in your routine right now and what you use every day. Okay. I am a skin type six in the Renee Rollo skin types. So skin type six as a skin type that has some hyperpigmentation. I do have some sunspots that are popping up. I still can get a little combination in the summer, but get dry in the winter. My concerns are keeping good skin el- elasticity, keeping a glow. I still can get occasional breakouts every once in a while. So that's a skin type six routine. So things in my routine is absolutely retinol. I've been using retinol for many, many years. That's definitely a holy grail. I have my own retinol in my line, but I do about once a week throw in a prescription retinoid. Actually, going back to our conversation about retinoids have been around forever. I could not use retinoids back in the day because it would bring out eczema on my skin. And now I'm able to use a prescription ever so slight without that happening. And it's because I now know how to 
counteract that dryness and that barrier damage, which is what was occurring. Sunscreen, of course, apply to the face and neck from the moment I get up in the morning. I'm huge into toners. I use our energy boosting toner, which is really good for blood circulation. I hang my head upside down every night before I go to bed for two minutes to bring blood flow to my face, to bring oxygen and circulation and new nutrients to the cells. That's my little free tip that doesn't cost you anything. Hang your head upside down for two minutes. I'm a huge proponent of acid. So in the skin type six is the Rene Rolo Pore and Wrinkle Perfecting Serum with salicylic, lactic, and glycolic. I'm working on a new moisturizer right now. So I've been testing that and that's been really good. So yeah, that's some of my highlights. Retinoids, retinol, sunscreen, vitamin C, peptides, niacinamide, vitamin B6, which is good for energy uh, and glowing skin. Uh, Ginseng, that's also good for creating a glow. I'm on it. Yeah, all those great ingredients. And I love that you use a toner. I feel like everyone's like, eh, toner, but I like toner. Toner's amazing. (laughs) Not like the alcohol ones from Y2K. (laughs) Exactly. Let me give you a quick reason why toners are essential for all of you listening. So toners do a couple of things. As long as they're alcohol free, they're not going to dry out the skin. So let's just get rid of those old school toners. And so when you think of your shower, you have glass shower doors, right? Or glass windows, if you have that, but it leaves like that filmy crud when it dries. That's chlorine, salts, and minerals that are found in your tap water. When you wash your face, when you wipe a toner over the skin, you're getting rid of that debris that could be dehydrating the skin. Secondly, when you leave your toner still damp on the skin, which is what I recommend, and then you put on your next product, it's like giving a drink of moisture to your skin. So it's really plumping and delivers a lot of water to your skin. So it's a great way to hydrate your skin. And we all want skin hydration. Skin cells are like fish. They need water to live. So we all need that. And then lastly, when the skin is wet from your toner and you put a serum on the skin, so let's just say a vitamin C serum, It is thought that the skin is 10% more permeable when it's damp. So water acts as a carrier. So the idea is that it may help penetrate those active ingredients deeper within the skin to drive better results. So if you're not using a toner, you definitely should. Amazing. And my last question for you, we're in this time where ingredients get hot. Like all of a sudden, it's like everyone's talking about hyaluronic acid or vitamin C, retinol. Are there any ingredients that you think are overrated? Are overrated? Well, I laugh when something's a hot ingredient because I was like, wait, you guys all know this ingredient's been around forever, right? Like, I mean, hyaluronic acid has been around since I started. So these ingredients have been around for a long time, but all of a sudden they're the latest buzzy things. And I get it. We love trends overrated. Oh my gosh, let me think. Someone brought in like a cactus kind of ingredient once. And I know you don't hear about that much, but do you remember when the cactus graphic was really popular? Like people had like bags with a cactus on it. And that was just like the style, right? Like clothes with a cactus on it. Well, somebody pitched me. They're like, I have a new cactus skincare routine. And they somehow had some ingredient that was supposedly coming out of cactus. It just was kind of silly to me because it was like tapping into that. So that's the first thing that comes to mind is that sometimes people tap into a trend, not because it's literally the greatest ingredient on the planet. It's just because it fell into what was trending at the time. I mean, it was the hot ingredient in 2017 when we all discovered succulents for the first time. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. (laughs) On today's show, you heard me, your host, Zoe Weiner, in conversation with Renee Rouleau. Routine Rundown is a well and good studios production. If you like what you heard, please share with a friend or two so they can join the conversation too. We also have a newsletter for you to subscribe to, which we've linked in the show notes for extra insight on all things mentioned in today's episode. And if you feel so moved, you can always drop us a line at podcast at wellandgood.com. Routine Rundown is produced by Taylor Camille, Jen Snyder, and Abby Stone, along with help from many other hands and brains at Well and Good. Our episodes are edited by Sarah Gabrielli and Maya Stone with additional production support from Malia Agadello and Ashley George. Our theme music was created by Nick Doss and our show art was designed by Natalie Carroll, Jenna Gibson, and Alyssa Gray. On the next episode of Routine Rundown. From me being bullied as a little girl with a unibrow to then growing it back and understanding the power I had from facing something that had so much power over me and locking it up as a secret to then saying I can actually change my perception of how I feel about it made me understand 
that invitation toward radical self-acceptance, that invitation for positive movement and feelings and affirmations toward myself and others. Thank you.